Hi everyone, my name is Ryan Grover. I'm the curator at the Biggs Museum of American Art, and I'm here to officially launch the digital representation of our latest exhibition, Award Winners 20. Um, for those of you that are new, this is the 20th anniversary of our partnership with the Delaware Division of the Arts to bring this exhibition together that features really terrific work by all of the individual artist fellows that the DDOA gives out money to on an annual basis. So these are all the choreographers and musicians and writers and poets and painters, printmakers, photographers, any kind of artwork, whether it be literary, performing, or visual art forms, um, we bring them all together into one group show. So this is kind of like a Best of Delaware 2020. And today, I wanted to sort of present to you what we have installed here at the exhibition. I just wanna give you a, qu a quick overview of what's happening here to um, sort of whet your digital appetite because this work will be available to be seen live for real starting July 8th. So between now and July 8th, expect a whole lot of new information. We'll be sending out information every couple of days versus uh, on Facebook and other social uh, media platforms about sort of a deep dive into the individual artists that are being featured here, this year's fellowship winners. And um, we've also asked some of the artists to contribute videos about what their life, what their sort of artistic experience has been like living under COVID-19 and sort of talking about what has changed in the last couple of months in their artistic practice. But just to give you a sort of quick overview, this is the work of Michael Fleischman here in Delaware. He uses cut cardboard pieces and creates sort of abstracted collage always with cardboard, these recycled materials, but he always sort of focuses on these new patterns, this new way of sort of seeing the material and creating these really beautiful kind of three-dimensional works. This is Robert Weston's work. Robert Weston, um, Weston has been a cabinet maker um, in New Jersey and Delaware for decades and he in his retirement is using storerooms and storerooms and storerooms of different kinds of veneers and specialty woods to create original two-dimensional compositions that really sort of play with wood grain and contrast in order to create new work. Many of you will remember Aaron Paskin's work. He's exhibited here at the Biggs Museum several times. We are so proud of him. He's kind of one of Dover's favorites, and he is a big time fellowship winner this year. We are so thrilled to have him back here at the museum. And Constance Simon, Constant M. Simon, these kind of contemplations of color with repetitious form. Her work is especially meditative and incredibly soothing at this time. In the second gallery, this space looks great, doesn't it? This is the work of my friend Nick Serator, largely a pastel artist. He uses, um, he depicts all sorts of images from all over the Delmarva Peninsula. And a new artist, an artist that I have not, um, um, had the great or had the good luck to see before but I'm super thrilled to have her now is Shelley Kuhn who does photography of sort of abandoned spaces kind of like looking for our humanity and the things that we leave behind Ooh, it's a favorite Chloe Meckle Downey, speaking of humanity, 
has brought us a series of self-portraits. that are also very much sort of explorations of color and um, color contrast, creating these sort of rhythmic uses of color across her canvases. Really just incredibly luscious, luscious work. And of course, everybody's a big fan of realism. And then the last visual artist I want to show you is Guy Miller. Guy has also exhibited here at the Biggs Museum before, although this is a very different kind of work. He plays with representation of African-American subjects on pop, and using pop art references like lunchboxes and Pez dispensers, kind of like creating his own universe of superheroes. So the museum has all sorts of literary work out to be able to share. We have music videos that artists have sort of represented and brought to um, bear within the, within the exhibition. And as I've alluded to before, we are gonna be doing a lot with public programming, mostly digital, but perhaps if everything goes really well, we'll have the ability to do a little bit more with um, live audience, um, experiences as well. You should definitely be checking out the Biggs Museum's website at www.biggsmuseum.org. As my last sort of shout out, some of the literary artists that we're going to be representing here are Sarah Barnett, Ann Colwell, Taylor Reed Adams, Kim DeCicho, Carl Ebert, and Caroline Simpson. And the musical artists that we are going to be um, featuring here at the museum are Michelle Ziques, Ralph Gresham Lamb, Mark Unruh, Jonathan Whitney, and Meredith Height Estevez. And we will see you here at the Biggs Museum. Hi, I'm Paul Wiegraf, Director of the Delaware Division of the Arts, and it's my pleasure today to join you virtually for the opening of Award Winners 20, recognizing 19 artist fellows in the 2020 calendar year for the Delaware Division of the Arts. These 19 artists competed in a pool of almost 140 artists in a blind juried process and were selected for the excellence of their artwork. We're especially appreciative of Ryan Grover and Carrie Lacey for putting together the physical exhibition as well as the virtual exhibition of these 19 artists' work. The exhibition will be available at the Biggs Museum until July 23rd, but in the meantime, you are welcome to peruse the virtual gallery as well as visit our website at arts.delaware.gov to read more about each of the 19 artists. This partnership with the Biggs Museum has been going on for 20 years now, hence Award Winners 20, and we are especially appreciative of the incredible work that Ryan Grover does in putting this exhibition together. It's, it's so wonderful to celebrate these artists. What would the arts be without the artists? As a division, we remain committed to supporting individual artists throughout their careers, uh, through a variety of grants, as well as technical assistance programs, offering opportunities for them to attend conferences, work with masters, and celebrate their artwork and their creativity. We are especially appreciative of those 19 winners this year. We hope that we can get together in person with them later in the summer to recognize them in person. But in the meantime, we trust you will enjoy the exhibition at the Biggs Museum as well as the virtual gallery.
we are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Some of you have come fresh from narrow jail cell. Some of you have come from areas where your quest, quest for freedom left you battered by the storms of persecution and staggered by the winds of police brutality. You have been the veterans of creative suffering. Continue to work with the faith that unearned suffering is redemptive. Go back to Mississippi. Go back to Alabama. Go back to South Carolina. Go back to Georgia. Go back to Louisiana. Go back to the slums and ghettos of our northern cities. Knowing that somehow this situation can and will be changed. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. I say to you today, my friend, Thank <laughs> you. 
I'm Taylor Reed Adams, and I'll be reading from my novel in progress, The Big Merc. Jerry meandered behind darkened apartments and shops for several blocks, sticking to shadows, poking and prodding through rank-smelling dumpsters and damp trash bins, climbing up the piles nimble as a billy goat. His sack was nearly full of bottles when the apartment buildings gave way to mansions, and he reached his favorite house. It was a two-story stone temple with a grand porch and ironwork scrolled like icing along the balconies. The house was set away from the sidewalk by a thin strip of grassy lawn, perfumed by a star magnolia and guarded by an ornate wrought iron fence. By the front gate sat a paper bag. This was the only house where he didn't have to sort the bottles himself. The generous person who lived there left them for anyone to take. As Jerry loaded the bag into his, he noticed there was something soft inside the bottles. He set the bag down and opened it up. A parcel of white butcher paper lay inside. He pulled it out, a sandwich. He wanted to eat it through the wrapper, but his eye caught a paper card taped to it. He removed the card and stuck the sandwich in the front of his overalls. He held the card out in the moonlight and squinted, then stiffened. It read, when you hide, you survive. Remember these instructions is stopped by the police or anyone suspicious of you. One, never run. If you do, you are already guilty. Stay calm, do not make quick movements. Two, avoid eye contact and be polite if stopped or questioned. If arrested, answer no questions and sign no statements or anything else. Three, under no circumstances should you admit to being drowned, ever. You cannot be proven drowned and you are not required to admit it. If you do, you forfeit your rights and you will be taken to the morgue. Four, do not believe the police if they tell you otherwise. If charged, plead not guilty no matter what they say. Five, ask for release on personal recognizance. Memorize this phrase. Six, anyone could be police. Anyone can betray you to authorities. He slowly put the card in his overalls and looked up at the house. None of the lights were on. The front porch was shrouded in a veil of pitch black. He listened if anyone was there, if anyone was watching. He looked across the street and down it. The street lay open and larger than ever. The asphalt was wet with dew, dark as coal, slicked by the reflection of the moon. For a moment he swore it flickered and revealed itself a trap, the darkness giving way to a glassy pool, the mouth of the river Styx. Jerry grabbed the sandwich instinctively to throw it out. These things were left for him, they knew, but he loosened his grip on it and kept it there. Jerry hurried away, walking as quickly as he could without running. It was lucky that no one on the street was there to see him. He concentrated so hard on blending in, he forgot to swing his arms and had the unnerving appearance of a dog walking on its hind legs. It wasn't until he reached the corner store across the street from the Maison de Charme, the one place he turned in his bottles each morning, that a sudden realization clubbed him in the chest. He had left his bag of bottles on the sidewalk where he found the note. Jerry stopped. He was ready to cry. The sun simmered through a shelf of clouds at the horizon. The avenue was already brightening. Its shapes and edges grew sharper in the light of dawn. The city would begin waking any moment. Jerry lurched, spinning around to face the direction of the house. He had to go back. When I think about writing, about all art in this time of pandemic, the writer who keeps coming into my head is Miguel de Unamuno. He said, it's not enough to cure the plague. We must learn to weep for it. I think what art allows us to do is to connect with each other's stories, to listen to each other's stories, and also in writing, especially to listen to our own story and to learn to share the suffering in it Yes, but that's the way we share the joy in it, too. And so 
I think that creative nonfiction is really important in that sharing of stories. Through creative nonfiction, we understand that our stories are important. Our stories connect us. And I think in this time, we might learn that our stories can heal us. The Cornice. We thought we were far enough from the edge of the snow-covered ridge that hovered above the glacier-carved ravine. Yet when Annika tripped on her shoelace, we gasped until she was on her feet again. We had entered this high point riddled with caution signs, chose to walk along this finger pointing to an imminent death, even paused to eat our lunch perched atop its severity. Haunted by ghostly implications, inhaled as cold mountain breaths. I feared the sound of snow cracking beneath my feet, the beginning of a fall, my stomach lodged in my throat, gravity pulling the rest of my body down, these two parts of me, a rubber band stretched to its breaking point. I feared the awareness of death that would surface in such a moment. I find myself again at the abyss, this time on a cornice of my own making. This is a fall that will begin when she is born and last my entire life. People tell me about their own plunges, what they found below, how they felt. I can't know this expanse from looking over its edge, not who she is, how I'll feel, what our connection will be. I only know this gravity will take me somewhere deep. I've come to this cliff precisely for this unknown. How rarely in life I've created my own precipice, walked past the caution signs, stepped onto the edge, not by accident, but excited by a vastness I can never contain. Nervous for the fall, for all is unknown. Yet here I am, leaning toward mine. The Scent of a Man The first man took the vanilla balm I dotted behind my right ear. I misplaced it on his collar when he gave me the spicy smell of his shampoo. Our heads had leaned into one another, a bead of his sweat kissing my temple. Unbeknownst to me, the second man took the cocoa butter off my arm during a quick baleo, the faster malanga music hurrying our steps. In the third man's close embrace, sweat grabbed my dress fabric and cucumber fresh deodorant seeped out. I never smelled it again. Somewhere in the fourth, fifth, sixth man, I lost the rainforest scent of my shampoo, and late in the evening, even the smell of my strawberry lip gloss disappeared. I gained musky deodorants, clean aftershaves, fresh colognes. They masked the odor of my sweat as my own perfumes had intended. After the tenth man placed the last corsage of scent upon me, the parade came to an end. As I twirled for the final time into my car, the flip of my dress sent a myriad of lingering exchanges about me. The evening's first dawned sense tarried elsewhere in others' cars, separated from me and one another, going to their new homes. This is a creative nonfiction memoir piece called Comfort. Judy takes comfort in the feathers her dead husband leaves for her to find. Brenda says she's comforted by her deceased son-in-law's return to her home as a talky, attention-seeking crow. Nothing, says Hank, whose wife died three months ago. He shakes his head, wipes his eyes. In a few moments, it will be my turn. I have no idea what I will say. We're at session five of the bereavement group I just joined. My daughter, Michelle, died almost five years ago. 
I'm giving Grieving 101 another try. We sit in a circle on folding chairs in the cluttered craft room of the senior center where shelves are lined with pottery projects. Air conditioning comes and goes. I shift in my chair, cross and uncross my legs. Like Hank, I can't say what, if anything, gives me comfort. I do know that I'm mystified by the answers Judy and Brenda gave. My conception of death doesn't include the idea that our dead loved ones send us physical signs. When the leader turns to me, I say the first thing I think of. Michelle's friends. They visit. They send flowers on Mother's Day, remember her birthday with notes on Facebook. Their children call me Grandma Sarah. I've never found it easy to talk about my feelings, especially on the spur of the moment. So I know I'll find myself revisiting the question of what gives me comfort. Later, as I walk my dog, a line from a novel I'd recently read arrives in my head. The strangest things console me. I think of the framed poster that was the last birthday gift Michelle gave me. The Brooklyn Bridge in winter it hangs over the landing between floors of my townhouse. As I walk down the stairs, I always imagine that I'm crossing the snow-covered bridge, walking behind a woman in black who holds over her head a red umbrella, the only jolt of color in the scene. I grew up in Brooklyn, and I love the poster, especially the way the silvery grays and winter whites contrast with the cool blue of the wall. The woman in the poster wears boots, a shawl over her jacket. Why does she walk the bridge in forbidding weather? Perhaps the artist wanted us to wonder about this. What I wonder is this. When did I notice that the woman in black looks like Michelle? Same round body, same slope to her shoulders, same shoulder length dark hair. I can't remember if the realization arrived before or after she died. I only know that on every trip down the stairs, I focus on the figure that reminds me of her. I receive a text from Suzanne, an honorary granddaughter. Hey, Grandma Sarah, she writes, look who visited me today. She's attached a photo of a ladybug that landed on her dashboard. Michelle loved ladybugs. She believed they brought luck. What do I say to Suzanne? The truth, or some version of it. Incredible, I write back. Thanks for sending. Love you. I add a few emoji hearts for emphasis. Does Suzanne believe Michelle paid her a visit? Perhaps. Do I believe that our dead loved ones send messages in the form of feathers, birds, bugs, or other physical signs? I do not. Do I believe that Michelle inhabits the Brooklyn Bridge poster? I cannot. I know that people derive comfort from such thoughts, so I keep my doubts to myself. And maybe I wish I could cross that bridge to feel that my daughter is somehow nearby. What gives me comfort? Now I can expand on the truth embedded in that first impromptu answer. I love that my daughter has left me the beautiful second family she built for herself, her husband, and her children. I love that the poster is in a place where I see it every day. I love that next to it, halfway down the stairs, hangs the framed certificate from the International Star Registry that Michelle's friends gave me. It designates a star in Scorpio, her zodiac sign, as Michelle shines on. She does. Hello, my name is Kim DeSico, and I'm the 2020 Delaware Division of the Arts Emerging Artist in Fiction. Today I'll be reading a short piece of mine titled Frost. Snow has fallen for most of the day. It started as dust but grew heavier as the afternoon wore on. With darkness comes a strong wind that causes the house to admit low, extended moans. 
I imagine this sound is the genesis for many a ghostly story. Perhaps even the one grandmother told me about Caleb Lovegood, a ship hand who drowned at sea. Not because he fell overboard, but because he was lashed to the bowsprit during a fierce storm as punishment for taking the captain's rum. A shiver runs along my spine as I sit at my desk and watch tiny spears of frost grow on the window. Each of the window's twelve panes were meticulously cut and set so we could enjoy a view without the elements intruding. Of course, frost isn't really an element, so it does what it chooses. Now it seems to flourish under my gaze, reaching, as if trying to grasp the falling snow. My desk is placed mid-room, so my back faces the fire. I expect the flames to wrap me with warmth and security, like the feel of my mother's arms when she would rock me to sleep. But my expectations are not met. I remain chilled. Rattling glass now joins groans from deep within the house to form a tempestuous symphony. The frost seems to grow brighter, whiter, with each howl of wind, as if it feeds on the sound. Again I shiver, more from this thought than any cold. What foolishness, I think, and push from my desk. My skirts brush its leg as I pass. Moving towards the window, I lay my hand on a wing-back chair. All real, all solid. I press my finger to the frost, then pull it away. A clear round spot is left where the ice has melted. Nothing to fear. It's no match against the warmth of my hand. But with each blast of wind, the frost regains substance, a translucent layer at first, then opaque crystals solidify as if alive. I touch the frost again. A bead of moisture remains on my finger as I move it away. I press this wetness to my lips. It's just water. Water with a hint of vinegar from cleaning the glass a few months ago. Again, nothing to fear. There isn't enough water in frost to hurt me. I'm not a captive ship hand. My heart startles at movement outside the window. I look past the frost and see evergreens in a chaotic dance timed to the wind-fueled orchestra inside my home. Each dip and bend tosses snow off of branches and, in and into the blustery current. My nostrils flare as they catch the sharp scent of icy cold pushing through minute spaces around the window's frame. I am reminded of a time 40 years ago when I was seven and playing in the snow with my sister Sarah. We ran outside on a bright crisp morning after it had snowed all night. We dove into drifts and threw handfuls of snow in the air to catch on our tongues. It was only minutes before we were covered in white and rosy cheeked Father cleared a path to the barn and checked on our cow and horses. Once finished, he came out and lobbed snowballs in our direction, hitting us low on our skirts. With delighted squeals, we ran <clears throat> and attempted to tackle him. We had no luck. His strong, tall frame easily caught Sarah as she launched herself into his arms. My feeble attempt to collide with his legs resulted with me on my backside in the snow. Mother witnessed our folly from the doorway. She'd come to call us back inside, but turned her sight. We then all heard horses approaching. On their backs rode three men in black hats and cloaks. Elders. They came for Sarah, who was accused of consorting with the devil through a corn husk doll. She was only ten. They searched the house, but no doll was found. They took her anyway, still wet and cold from the snow. They put my sister in a dank prison cell, along with other accused. A cough settled upon her, a cough that seemed to drown her, they said. She was dead within a week. They brought her back to us in a cart. With tender hands, my father carried her inside and laid her on our trestle table. 
I stretched out a timid hand to move pale hair from her face. I stared for a long time and wondered at how still she was, how flat, now that life no longer animated her body. But it was her lips that mesmerized me. They were cracked and white, as if covered with frost. Hello, I'm Carrie Ann Ebert, and I am the Emerging Fellow in Poetry. I have three poems that I'd like to read for you today. The first was published in the Mojave River Review. Here I am with wings tucked inside my body. You crush the bloom to inhale its scent, only to scrape it up, save its velvet shreds staining the cement. Keep them in your pocket for later. Early in the morning, I hide my want from cold. Here I am sniffing the remains of the shirt I used to practice my stitching. Here I am pressing remains of self-bought flowers, the need to measure something a little more slick on my skin. At night, I crawl under covers that smell of muscle rub and lavender oil. I digest myself, dissolve, slow as a heavy frost, the weight of its tread on the small of my back. I dream before I fall asleep. Clouds thick as the wave of your hair accumulate at the base of my neck. A glossa caprina, the grease moth, attracted to light and sugar, feeds on grease of decomposing bodies and butter. Forensic scientists find it useful in their work. What if I lose myself flying farther into the wind? Here I am clinging to the underside of a branch. This next poem was chosen by Ian Halley Pollock for the Sandy Crimmins National Prize in Poetry. Um, sponsored by Philadelphia Stories. It's called Milk Sickness, A Mother Worries As Her Children Sleep. Sometimes I see snakes in a milk pail, noisy tumbles of coils and scales. I lie awake, steeled, vigilant, absorb the discord of writhing bodies in my opaque world. I wonder if they know they swim in sacrifice. Maybe they think it's water edged by meadow. Maybe they dream the spinning of their skins will loose them to catch the scent of mouse or egg in a dreamscape of venom and froth. Or is it panic? Black, thick, rich like cream. Panic that weighs them down, roiling blind only to find they're trapped and soused in humors. Maybe the milk's a mirror, a mother of pearl shine that splashes the black snake hole in my eye. If I stare at the waves, the sloshes of knacker, maybe my tongue will smell a way out, lift me with a swell as the vipers sink like weighted calcite beneath the tide, black pearls lost at sea. Maybe then stillness will claim me a silence only I can taste, like stolen butter. This last poem hasn't been published yet. It was inspired every night at midnight when I got off work, I would drive by the museum and see the sculpture called a loft outside, and I saw different images in it at night. Um, so I wrote this poem. It's called a Docent Interprets Aloft by Erica Zoe Lusto. Look how the tree sculpture outside the museum transforms itself into an old woman at dusk, straining against the wind. Strings of black birds between tree and building become hair reflecting night, like inky strands of DNA flying wild. Her chin juts out, forehead cuts the blast, dividing destruction into streams. No strength like the strength of a crone 
hefting her will. Witness the bird strung up by wire, tree to building to lobby in long echoes of lines, little ones dark as a mother's eye smudge mottled by migration and despair. Small children caught in the gale fall into cues, absorb the ligatures drawn through their spines. Notice their mother, separated, held back as they fly, carried away on the waves of men's breath, whispered without regard for their wings. Consider it now from another's perspective. The woman disappears without a trace. In her place, a shadow hand raised from depths, tensed like a sorcerer mid spell, the birds unbecome children, unbecome hair, unbecome. In their absence, dark streams spew from fingertips, bent on vanishing all trace of memory from the air. Observe the final view in moonlight, silver tree standing ghostly and still, revealing its metal. Listen to the hollowed out center as the wind enters its throat. Thank you. Mm -hmm.